back again and we are continuing in Bible interpretation. Today we're going to look at lesson number three and the theme of today's lesson is the Old Testament from the perspective of a narrative and a narrative what you remember is a story. Old Testament is mostly historical books so we look at how do we interpret the Old Testament from a historical narrative perspective. We are on page number 18 and the Old Testament we're gonna uh, mainly focus on the stories. So how do you interpret the stories and apply that and interpret that in our lives? So let's just revise. Last week we looked at the questions. Can you remember? Who, what, where, when, and how? And then that 25 questions, if you just, in, uh, if you just turn back, you will remember that we went through all those questions from Tony Merida on page 12. There's 25 questions which we can ask. So it will be good if you write those questions down because the more you think of the question and learn how to train your brain, how to, to ask the right questions, you get the right answers. If you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. So it's true with scripture interpretation. You have to ask the right questions. And there's 25 questions that will guide you. But the main importance is the six questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. How do we observe, organize, and answer these questions in an historical narrative perspective? So, number B, the literary structure of the story. So, the Bible reveals to us a loving creator and a gracious redeemer. And in the Old Testament, there's lots of stories. And let me remind you, there is 17 Old Testament books that falls under the category of narrative. Genesis to Esther, parts of Job and some of the prophets tells us stories. We all love stories. We love to read it to our children and we all like stories with good endings. So just think of a story you like or love or have read recently and then apply these principles we're going to teach you today to story. You'll see this specific ways how do we interpret stories. So a story starts with a problem and then there is a uh, how do you solve the problem? You have a solution of a resolution and that is the end of the story. So all stories starts with a problem and the Bible addresses some of those problems directly or indirectly. For example, Abraham, he struggles to understand faith and through his struggle of understanding faith, he eventually found faith and he becomes the father of faith. There was a bad king in Israel, Saul, and the problem was how do we find a good king? And then we read how Samuel went to search for the king and the first aspect of a king is God look at the inside, we look at the outside. Saul was a magnificent, beautiful, tall, handsome guy. On the outside he was right, but on the inside he was wrong. He was bad and evil. And when Samuel went to anoint the brothers, he looked at the outside. And God said, you look at the outside, but I've rejected all these. And then he asked Jesse, is there another son? And Jesse himself didn't even think of it. David because he was a shepherd, he was the least of his brother, but his heart was right. So it starts with the problem of a heart. God searches for people after his own heart and if our heart is right, God can use us. That's an example. And then the story of David, of course, how God found a man after his own heart and he becomes the beloved king who was the forefather of Jesus Christ. So the problem moves towards the story. And that includes other story, other characters. Abram's sto story includes Lot, it includes his wife, later it includes his son, 
David's story, Saul was there, Samuel was there, and his children. So story includes other characters. And then there's a turning point, a climax. The heart of the story is in the middle, which we call the climax. And then we understand the key meaning of the story. And then falling action behind, because of the climax, the story moves forward again through actions and discussions. Call it the falling action. And then the resolution or the ending, the problem is solved. It is over. So biblical stories all have this aspect, but of course it's much more complex than a novel or a movie you watch. So the next one is the scenes. You can break down the story into small scenes. You have a long story. There's a lot of movies about historical characters or historical events. And then you have episodes and you even have season one with five episodes, season two with five episodes or ten episodes. So like the biblical story, if you take, for instance, the story of Abram, you can divide it into smaller sections with each one have its own story. So for that, we need to ask, what is the time, the setting and the narration? What is the scenes? And the scenes is marked with time. The Bible gives time divisions like the next day or the morning or when the sun, sun rose or after an event, uh, the sun was going down, Genesis 15. And the Lord said to Abram, uh, stimulus action, the story of Hannah in Samuel 12 described Hannah's praying while Eli is watching. Good homework for you. John, the book of John, starts with seven days. The first day, the next day, go and read John and see if you can see the stories that happen on these days and each day have a specific story. So, Mathematically, it is lined out for us. So, the scenes have divisions marked by settings. For instance, there's a place. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. There's geographical figures or events, features. Now, there was famine in the land. Or in Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel read in the year of the earthquake. An historical event or when this pharaoh was ruled or during the time of this king so these settings we would need to change a change of character or announcements then the princess of pharaoh saw her so there's context so we can dig into history and refer to events divisions made the indication of a narration so the first one the author commented the end of the story of jo Jacob wrestling with God, Moses gives this comment. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinlu of the tie that is on the hip socket. So, the book of Genesis, these are the days of. Uh, the beginning of. These are the genealogy of. So, there's always events we can look Description, when Abram was 75 years old, he departed from Haran. A straight narration, so Abram went down to Egypt and sojourned there. A dialogue, Abram said to Sarah's wife, you know you are a beautiful woman in appearance. There's structure uh, in the story and then it brings us to the original meaning and the application. After the practical analysis questions are asked, we can then do scene division and structure. From there we go to the literary analysis, the historical analysis and the them thematic analysis which will further answer the questions we have asked in the text. And that brings us to what is the application to the original audience? Why was this specific piece of scripture or as we look now in the story of an historical narratives, why was this story given here? Why was the story of Lot in the story of Abram? And of course it shows us Abram started by faith and he ended up as the father of faith. Lot also started but he ended up as a cave dweller and his 
children becoming the enemies of Christ. So in the life of Lot, we can see the consequences of the life of unbelief. Now, let us look at a specific story in order to explain it to you. Genesis 15, verse 5 to 21. We will go through this and then I will explain it to you and then you're going to do one practical session by yourself. So the practical analysis question, who, what, where, when, why and how. In Genesis, of course, the writer is Moses. The listeners is the audience of the first generation of Israelites in Exodus. I'm on page 20 if you're not following. The reading audience is likely the second generations. The first people were addressed to. The second generation were the people that read that. The Israelites had doubt about the Exodus from the time they left Egypt and they rebelled before and after Kadesh Barnea. This biblical narrative is in the Pentateuch. Pentateuch, of course, the first five books is part of the Patriarch Fathers uh, of Faith. The message is follow the Lord, to follow God or Jehovah, not Pharaoh. In the immediate context is where Abraham has been declared righteous by faith. Abraham believed in God and therefore he was reckoned as righteous. The whole book of Romans and part of Galatians is written about this verse. Abraham believed in God. Abraham was doubting his inheritance in the promised land, even though he expressed faith in God. And then we found a story that might be weird for us, where Abraham had to cut an animal in two, and then God moved through with a smoking pot and flaming torch. So what does these things represent? Why does it say that God made a covenant with Abram when he already had made a covenant? Why is the story here? The Israelites are doubting their inheritance in the promised land. The enemies are large. The way is hard. They don't want to go. The story reassures them. This story, of course, points to Christ, who will one day sacrifice his life on the cross so that we can walk in obedience and in faith by God's grace. So let us look at the division of the scenes. The first scene is the dialogue between God and Abram. Verse 7, So he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur the Chaldeans to give you the land to take possession of it. Remember the covenant or the law in Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, out of Egypt. Here we see the same thing. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Ur the Chaldeans to give you this land to take it possessions. But Abram said, Ha, ah, see, Abram understood if he have the land and he have no children, who will inherit the land? Oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So now we see the second action. Abram responds. Abram brought all these, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each others. The birds, however, he did not cut, cut in half. Scene three. Then birds of prey came down, but Abram drove them away. The fourth scene. Time remark. As the sun was setting, Abram fell asleep, and thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Very prophetic words. Number five, dialogue. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not your own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. And so the story goes on. But I will punish the nation. They served as slave, and afterwards I will bring them out with great possessions. You are ever will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, and the sins of the Amorites have not reached its fullness. Time remark, when the sun had set. So, as the sun was setting, now the sun is set, darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. The author's comment, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land, wetland, from the river of Egypt 
to the great rivers in the Euphrates, the land of the Kenizzites, the Kamunites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephalites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gershonites, and Jebusites. So, specifically, this land, from here to there, these are the people. So, Abram had no confusion which land will be given to him. C. Structural analysis. In looking for structures, notice that the first scene and the last scene had parallels. They both are about the land and God's covenant with Abram. The time remarks this. Scene 2, specific times, which was the climax. God explained the promise. The story structure we will look now. The story chapter is A, B, C, B, A. Look at that parallel. A, problem. Abram doubts. And the covenant is renewed. Action required. God prepared a covenant by sleeping but sleeps and doubts. So, sorry. Abraham prepares a covenant but sleeps and doubts. See the turning point. God explains the future promise and reassure Abraham. So action. Theophany. Theophany is a new word. I will explain that just now. Passes as God takes the covenant out. The resolution. God affirms his land covenant. The theophany is a way in which God appears in the Old Testament. And in this specific area, God appears in the form of a torch, a flaming torch and a flaming fire, a smoking pot and a blazing torch. That is a way God appeared. So the structure and the main point is revealed, where God made a offer and a self-sacrificial oath. This shows that God imputes righteousness. And Abram believed and he was reckoned righteous. So what is the historical context? Here we look at how covenants was cut, how promises was made. Today we go to an attorney or to a lawyer and we write down an agreement and we sign it, both parties, and it is sealed by an official government seal and each party receives a document and the document is binding. But in those days, it didn't happen like that. The historical context is if you make a covenant with somebody, you take an animal, you cut it in two, and you walk through the animal parts, implication, we are bound with each other by walking through. And if we break the covenant, I have the right to cut you like I cut the animal. So it was very, very severe by breaking the covenant in those days could mean, uh, mean a death upon you if you break the covenant. So in this session, God walks through, which imply that he will enforce the covenant. God makes the covenant. He himself is taking the oath of making the covenant. And in his grace, God is Abram's substitute, swearing by his own death that Abram will inherit a very, very powerful way of cutting and making promise, a very high promise is called a covenant. So the thematic concern. So whenever God shows in the world, it's called a theophany. A theophany God shows himself. We see that in the cloud by day and the pillar by night in the time when they exited out of Egypt. So what does this teach about God's work in the covenant? teaches us about God's grace and encouragement to affirm his promise to Abram that he would inherit the land God swears on his own herd instead of inquiring Abram to swear. It's a covenant renewal. Does this point to Christ? Of course, Christ will one day make a sacrifice. He will sacrifice himself in our place and going to the cross to fulfill God's covenant redemption. Lastly, the uh, not largely, original meaning, Abram doubts about God's covenant promise to the land were removed as God affirmed his covenant with a sacrificial oath. The original audience there is the first and the second generation. They are to fulfill God's promise to Abram. They see the theophany of God's presence. Remember, pillar by day. And the cloud of fire by night, God promise are dependent on his self-earth, not Israel's courage. 
How do we apply this in preaching? Page 24, number 8. We are children of Abraham. How? By faith. Ultimate Tiffany, Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is the ultimate realization and ultimate manifestation of God. He made his promises by dying himself on the cross. Now, I've given you an example. Page 24 and 25 and 26 and 27 is another example. I'm not going to read that to you. You all can read yourself. So you're going to do this as a self-study. It is the story of 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1 to 12. For a self-study, go and read this and make sure you understand that. Read through this on your own after this class or tonight and then tomorrow you hand it in to your teacher. Tell them and make your notes and show your notes as way of studying. So that is homework. Homework you're going to do 2 Corinthians 12 is one to do. You're going to work through this. Take a piece of paper, make notes and next session hand it in to your, for your teacher or if the teacher can ask one or two students to give feedback. Now in the class. You're going to do a similar exercise. Genesis 20 verse 10 to 20. Divide the passage into scenes and write the structure. 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes. If English is not your first language, it may take a little bit longer. So for the rest of this class, until the time is finished, divide passage Genesis 12 verse 1 to 20. Write the scenes and the structure. So before you start, let me close the session. Conclusion, practical questions. Remember the literary structure of the story, the divisions of scenes, time, settings, narration, historical, thematical, literary concerns, the original meaning, and then some review questions. So before you start next class, I want you to review these questions. What are the five parts general pattern of the story. Number three, what are the three types of divisions? What are the three types settings? And what are the four types of narration divisions? And then what is a theophany? So before next class teacher, when the class starts next time, before I teach lesson four, ask these questions and make sure your students understand. Have a blessed day. Bye.